Hello, um, I'm Janice Carter and I'm currently working in the district plan review team and working on the natural hazards chapter. So I'm here to give you um, an overview. Have you got that? an overview of the natural hazards chapter. The draft natural hazards chapter has just gone up on the website, so I um, encourage you all to have a look at it. Um, it includes some things um, that will be dealt with, um, that are dealt with now, and some things are not in here that will be dealt with later. Um, in terms of the scope, what I have here is, um, the, there are many things that affect the district plan review, and some of those things are the statutory directions, which I'll come to. Um, I'll talk about what we have in this version of the um, part natural hazards chapter and I'll talk about what we are considering changing in the district plan through this review process in terms of flooding and liquefaction and the other session is talking about the Port Hills. We also want to have um, your feedback on this process that we're going through at the moment because your comments are um, really important in terms of how it affects your property. Um, So we're keen to get your input on what's being considered and find out what, what is important to you. Um, we need to know whether you think we're on the right track, whether there's things that we need to rethink, um, and what other, other things that we haven't thought of that you think we should be thinking of. And that relates to the, the person who, who asked a question earlier. There may be things in the natural hazards chapter that you think should be there, and, and we, we need to know what those are. Through this process, you can talk to planners um, at the council. You can email the DP review email site. Um, and there's also a survey monkey. And comments on the district plan review are due on the 30th of March. And notification of the, the whole um, district plan review that forms part of this um, phase um, is scheduled for mid-year. So what, what are we um, covering in this round? Um, obviously we're reviewing the natural hazard provisions in the district plan. Um, the focus on this section is on the urban parts of the district. Um, the rural parts will be dealt with um, in the next phase. We've, what we've proposed is a new objective and policy framework um, relating to hazards generally, but also some specific prob, um, policies and objectives on flooding, slope instability and liquefaction. Um, In terms of um, the flood hazard, we, we've looked very carefully at the flood management areas that Graham was talking about before. Um, in terms of liquefaction hazard, I think it's important to note at this point that when we use the word liquefaction in the natural hazards chapter, we're talking about um, lateral spread, sand boils, and all the other things that, that eject out of the, um, the, the, the ground. It's not just... Um, but it's not lateral, lateral spread is a part of liquefaction and that's how we've expressed it in the natural hazards chapter. Um, what we're not covering is the coastal hazards which will be in phase two. We haven't um, changed the rules on ponding areas that Graham was talking about before, that will also be in phase two. Um, and this issue of high hazard flood areas um, will also be in the following chapter. So some, some people um, might need a bit of a district plan 101. Um, what is the district, district plan about? Um, it affects um, what you can do on your land and your property. It provides objectives and policies and rules to achieve sustainable land, of the, um, land use of the district. And all those things are, are pursuant to the Resource Management Act 1991. In terms of what, we've, what it produces, it, it creates zoning and overlays. In this case, there are natural hazard overlays, such as the flood management areas, which set minimum floor levels um, for your houses. And I'll, we'll come to this later in the talk. The district plan generally allows for activities compatible with the zone and, and the overlay to occur without the need to obtain a resource consent. Um, and they're called permitted activities and provides for provisions where greater management of the um, land is required through the resource consent process. Um, the district plan will require resource consent applications to be obtained for some activities where the activity doesn't comply with the rules and the standards, um, such as in the flood management um, overlays and other overlays that you'll hear when you go through to the, the um, slope instability section. The objectives and policies um, that are in the natural hazards chapter are important for providing the overall direction or the philosophy or framework um, alongside any assessment matters or matters of discretion 
um, to assess applications for resource consent. And so they're important to set the direction of, of where everything else is heading. So it's important to look at the provisions of the draft chapter to see how um, the natural hazards um, provisions that we're proposing affect you. You can find out if you're located in a flood management area, and it's likely that if you were in a flood management area before, that you will be in a flood management area under this um, new proposal. In fact, the um, flood management areas have increased in size um, from the previous plan, and um, I will come to that later as well. In terms of um, what goes into a district plan, there's actually quite a few things that go into it that the council has to take on board. It's not just um, what, what the council itself wants to put in it. It's um, affected by a number of statutory directions, and some of those are listed above. The Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Act, um, the Land Use Recovery Plan was um, developed under the uh, Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Act, and Action 42 requires protection from the risks of high hazard areas, um, which is generally your one in 500 year events, and from other risks such as flooding, liquefaction, and sea, sea level rise elsewhere in the city. Um, the council is required to ensure that natural hazards are properly considered in land development decisions. Then other um, statutory directions come from the Resource Management Act, um, which gives council responsibilities under section 31 to control the effects or use and development of land subject to natural hazards. Um, I just note at this point that the, the um, national government is considering changes to the Resource Management Act, which would include a change to section six um, matters of national importance, which would increase um, the amount of um, information required in terms of natural hazards and also require the management of significant risks from natural hazards to be a, nat a matter of national importance. Another statutory direction that is important in, in, in putting into the district plan is the regional policy statement. And um, that statement basically requires to, um, the council to avoid or largely mitigate the effects of a one in 200 year event across the whole city, including developing minimum floor levels um, for new buildings, which is why um, the flood management areas um, identify properties affected by that event. Um, the regional policy statement also requires a um, direction to manage liquefaction hazard, and it also has a direction to ensure the integrated management of natural hazards across agencies, which is why we've actually got quite a lot of um, agencies involved in this um, um, talk today. Also, the regional policy statement has a direction to avoid um, high hazards. The, I just put this slide up here just to quickly um, indicate what that is. The high hazard areas are basically um, a 1 in 500 year event, but it's the deepest and fastest parts of that 1 in 500 year event, and I will come to that later on in this, this discussion. And finally, we have some statutory directions from the Canterbury Earthquake Royal Commission, um, who recommended that the potential effects of earthquakes, including liquefaction, um, should be taken into account in zoning and land use and subdivision consents. So what we have now in, in the district plan, well, neither the city plan nor the Banks Peninsula district plan ha have a clear fo focus on natural hazards. Um, at the moment, the flood management areas are primarily along the main river systems. Um, the plan has very little reference to liqu liquefaction, and um, we, of course, I've just mentioned we've got some new statutory directions that we have to take into account, including the LERP. What we are considering? We are considering objectives which um, emphasise the need to reduce the risk from the effects of natural hazards, to increase public awareness of the range and scale of natural hazards, um, and to facilitate the repair of earthquake damaged land. Policies um, that we have um, considered in this um, district plan review, um, we have some general policies and some specific flooding and liquefaction policies. The policies um, seek to avoid development if the risk is unacceptable to life, otherwise mitigate with the level of control depending on the degree of risk. To prevent transfer or worsening of risk to other properties um, and the adoption of a precautionary approach where there is uncertainty and serious effects of multiple hazards could, could occur. 
I'll just go on now to talk specifically about the flood hazard. Um, this picture shows Flockton Street, Marahau, in June 2013, and it's probably looked quite similar um, just a few weeks ago. The next um, photo is of the Heathcote River flooding, again um, last year, but um, also likely to have looked very much like that, if not worse, um, this year. In terms of the draft um, proposed flooding, um, the policies that we are looking at, I think I've already gone through them in a sort of more general way, avoid development in high hazard areas, um, reduce flood damage in areas affected by major flood events by raising floor levels, and continue to protect the capacity of the flood um, ponding areas and a stock bank system. The next slide is actually um, just a, a continuation of the policies, which um, emphasises what Graham Harrington was saying before about um, keeping waterway setbacks um, that we currently have in the district plan. Just in terms of the next phase, um, the idea is that they will be extended into the next phase. In this phase, we haven't actually looked at them. There's quite a lot of work involved in reviewing them, but um, the idea is that we would um, maintain those in, as an important part of our um, flood management. What this means across the city, um, this, this map here is basically the new flood management map showing the various um, high hazard um, and the flood management areas. The high hazard um, is mainly in the WIMAC, of the area to the top, um, that red area. Um, further areas across the city for high hazard may be mapped um, in stage two, but at this stage the high hazard areas are just south of the WIMAC area river. Um, the dark blue areas on the map here um, which in now include Cranford Basin, um, are the, the ponding areas. Um, I don't know if you can see from here, but if you get a chance when, you've, when we finish here and you go outside to the maps um, on the walls, you'll see that we've mapped on the existing extent of the flood management area. Um, the, blue, the light blue areas are the proposed flood management areas and they're quite larger than the ones that we had before. And I'll come to um, why that is the case um, shortly. Um, the map shows the extent of flood uh, management area with an allowance for 0.5 metres of sea level rise um, and the management area is based on the 1 in 200 year event. Um, we're actually looking at another option to, in, um, to increase, use an allowance of 1 metre sea level rise which again would affect the actual boundaries of this um, blue area. So there is a map out on the foyer that shows um, for the Avon catchment what, what it would mean if it was one metre that we are um, built into the model for sea level rise and, and the properties that that would also affect. Um, there is approximately at the moment 30% greater um, area of Christchurch covered under the flood management areas than there was before. This is a close-up showing um, the in inclusion of the Flockton Basin. This is this big piece in the middle. Um, this area is always flooded, um, so it, it is included now in the natural um, hazards chapter. And you might ask the question, well, why wasn't it included before? We propose to um, amend the flood management areas um, by using the most up-to-date LIDAR information, which is now much more precise. We've also... Thanks. Um, the model for the 1 in 200 year event has also now captured areas beyond the main stem of the rivers, so that's why Flockton Basin is um, showing up in this map that we're proposing to put in the district plan review. Um, also, um, Graham Harrington mentioned before about the changes in ground level post-earthquake, um, and the map showed um, red areas where the ground has dropped and green areas where the ground has um, tilted towards the, um, the city. Now, those changes in ground level have had an impact on the extent of the flood management areas. But it's, it's not, as I said, the, the sole reason why there's an increase in flood management areas. It's the better modelling and the including of areas that were beyond the main stems that um, are an important part of that um, equation. The, the actual rule um, for the... Um, flood management area is based on a, a min requiring a minimum finished floor level and that uh, is based on the higher of a 1 in 200 year rainfall event and a 1 in 20 year tidal event or a 1 in 200 year tidal event if you're close to the, 
the coast, and a 1 in 20 rainfall event. And then the council reserves are um, sort of like a bottom line, 11.8 metres above the CC datum as a, um, as a backstop. So the models in each of the catchments um, for, for Christchurch determine the minimum finished floor levels um, based on the inputs of the particular location. And the minimum floor levels um, apply to new buildings and some rebuilds, but of course um, won't apply to existing buildings who are exercising existing use rights. Um, all levels, as Graham mentioned earlier, have a 400 millimetre freeboard added, plus the 0.5 metre um, sea level rise as the first option, and if you download the text um, from the web, you'll see that we've also put an option in there um, and asking for feedback on um, the one metre option. Um, we've, we've also put something else um, to try and reduce the number of resource consents around the minimum floor levels, and that's um, what we're calling a sort of permitted activity rule. Some of the areas, um, and if you go out to the, um, the foyer, you'll see that some of these areas, um, go back, some of these um, pale blue areas have a, a pink area around them, and that's what we're calling um, the um, fixed floor levels. And if you're in a fixed floor level area, um, you may be able to um, be a permitted activity to do your rebuilds and your new houses if you comply with the minimum floor level that the council is able to give you. If you can't comply with it, well then you'd be into the restricted discretionary um, activity um, resource consent. At the moment in the district plan, all um, development within the flood management area is a restricted discretionary activity and requires resource consent. And the idea of identifying areas where we can be a bit more specific about what the minimum floor level should be, um, reducing the number of consents as a result of that process. At the moment, we've only got um, fixed floor levels um, proposed for the Avon, the Styx and the Heathcote. Um, we haven't done the modelling and we haven't got the certainty on the modelling to put fixed floor levels on some of the other catchments such as Sumner um, and further inland. Okay, some other rules that we have in, in the Natural Hazards chapter on flooding. Um, there is the filling rules which incorporate the um, SARA uh, land repair rules. They will continue to be a permitted activity throughout this process. And also, um, to, to create a bit of a level playing field, we've also added a small amount of filling, which isn't earthquake repair related, um, up to 0.3 metres above ground, but limited to 10 cubic metres above ground per site, and, and that is in the flood management areas. Overall, though, there's resource consent required for most filling in the flood management areas. Okay, I'll just move on briefly um, to liquefaction. It's one of the issues that's also covered in the draft natural hazards chapter. I know it wasn't advertised um, um, clearly in the um, brochures, but it um, is an important part of the natural hazards chapter that um, people might want to have an input in as to what, what we're suggesting in that area. Um, the picture to the left is the Ferry Mead Bridge, just straight after the, um, the February 22nd earthquake. And um, the, the picture to the right is, is my own house after the um, February earthquake. You can see the typical sand boils um, that was, I was talking about earlier. And this is um, the lateral spread example near the Ferry Mead Bridge. Oh, not, not the Ferry Mead Bridge, the Fitzgerald Avenue Bridge. Both um, sand boils, um, lateral spread, um, all parts of liquefaction. Okay, just to give you a bit of background, which you're probably all very aware of, liquefaction occurred at the main earthquake event in 2010 and 2011. Um, extensive damage to buildings um, and infrastructure, cracking, deformation and differential settlement. Um, and 400,000 tonnes of silt came to the surface during those events. So it would be a little bit remiss if the natural hazards chapter didn't do something to address that. And as I said earlier in my um, talk, the um, Royal Commission um, made it quite clear that something should be done in terms of land use rules and subdivision to deal with liquefaction. So we've had a go at trying to put something down, but we want to hear what you have to say about what we've come up with. Um, it's by no means um, set in stone, and we'll be looking forward to hearing comments. The 
the proposed um, draft liquefaction policies talk about ensuring um, that we have a geotechnical assessment before rezoning subdivision and development. And that is building on what we already um, have in terms of the um, guidelines, but also formalising it in the district plan. The level of assessment um, that will be required by the council will reflect the level of susceptibility. And what we've come up with, um, with the help of ECAN and GNS, is um, a line. You can't see it very well on this plan. Um, if you go out on the foyer at the end, you'll see that there's a line coming down the back of Christchurch at near, the, near the airport. It divides the city into east and west. And the, the proposal is to basically recognise that the areas east of the line, uh, we would need to have a lot more assessment on whether there's liquefaction potential on the site for subdivision. And on the west of the site, acknowledging that liquefaction is less likely to occur in that area and requiring a lesser amount of information for subdivision. In terms of the rules, as I said before, um, formalising the just additional geotechnical requirements in the plan, we've got the new liquefaction line on the maps and we're proposing subdivision east of the city and in small pockets of Banks Peninsula to be a restricted discretionary activity. Um, rather than previously, it, it was a controlled activity. Um, but the area west of the line, where there's less information required, we are retaining, proposing to retain that as a controlled activity for subdivision. So um, the idea is to get the level of information required to uh, um, ascertain whether it's um, safe to build on the site and get the right information and the right mitigation measures and um, foundation improvements required or um, ground improvements required before um, subdivision is approved for the site. Um, an additional matter of discretion, um, we've added um, a matter to include a consideration of liquefaction for residential intensification um, on larger sites within that area east of the line. Most of the activities that we've highlighted to have that additional matter of discretion on liquefaction are already restricted discretionary activities, so it involves um, large areas of land where um, there might be intensive residential development or six units going in on a particular site or various things like that. <coughs> 